Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let me start by introducing Francis Cisna, the Director of United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. He's here to provide a briefing on the attempted suicide bombing in New York and how it was enabled by flaws in our immigration system. After he speaks and takes some of your questions, I'll be back up to answer questions on other news. Uh, and as always, if you can stay focused on the topic at hand, uh, that'd be great. Thanks so much, Director. Hello. I'm here to talk to you about uh, yesterday's incident and kind of give you some of the context and perspective uh, in the immigration system, how it works or how it didn't work in this case, and what are the sorts of things that our administration is proposing to change it to make it better. So as you all know, yesterday the suspect Akayed Ula was arrested uh, in an attempted bombing in New York City, uh, and there's an immigration aspect to this. The immigration aspect is that he immigrated to this country. He was a green card holder, a lawful permanent resident. Uh, he came to this country uh, based on a family connection to a U.S. citizen. Uh, he was a national of Bangladesh. Uh, the U.S. citizen in question was his uncle. And that U.S. citizen many years ago came to this country originally as a visa lottery winner. So uh, this is the general background. I now want to try to explain what all that means, uh, where those terms come from, what the significance of all that is. Uh, first, I would explain that uh, for those who aren't aware, our immigration system has two principal components. There's a family-based component uh, through which the suspect in yesterday's attack, uh, alleged uh, bombing incident, uh, came through, and there's an employment-based component. In any given year, we have about one million immigrants. One million people come here, get green cards, immigrant visas. In fiscal year 15, for example, of that one million, about 72% about of our immigrants came based on a family connection. And only 6%, or about one out of 15, came based on an employment or job connection, job offer. So you can see the immigration system is heavily weighted towards family migration. There are other categories of people that immigrate as well, besides just family and employment based, including refugees, asylees, and of course the visa lottery people that I just referenced, but those are very small compared to those two larger categories. I want to talk now about these in particular, the family based, the employment based, and then the visa lottery. In the, infam in the family based uh, migration category, there are s multiple categories of people. The principal category of family based immigrant are called immediate relatives. These are people who are the spouses or children, uh, nuclear family members of US citizens. In a given year, you have about half a million people in that category. Uh, in fact, I have better numbers than that. Uh, in fiscal year 16, in that category, these are people who are the nuclear family members of US citizens. There were about 566,000 people that immigrated. An additional category in the family-based universe are what are called preference categories. These are more extended family uh, connections. Uh, these include, um, let's see here, these include unmarried, uh, the first category, unmarried sons and daughters of U.S. citizens. Second category, spouses of green card holders. Unmarried sons and daughters of green card holders. Third category, married sons and daughters of U.S. citizens. Fourth category is brothers and sisters of U.S. citizens and their children. That's the category that yesterday's suspect came in under. So. The suspect in yesterday's bombing came in under the most extreme, remote possible family-based connection that you can have under current U.S. immigration law, that being the child of the sibling of a U.S. citizen. Uh, under the employment-based categories, uh, that's a much smaller number. Only 140,000 slots are allocated in a year to that category, but you're really only getting about half that number of actual workers because the spouses and children count towards that cap. There you have a number of categories, including categories for extraordinary ability workers, you have people with advanced degrees, you have people who are skilled professionals, and uh, immigrant investors, multiple categories, but a much smaller number than the family-based categories. Uh, and again, I remind you, only one out of 15 of our immigrants come in under those skilled categories. Let me turn now to the diversity visa, which is the other visa program that is relevant to yesterday's events. The diversity visa, or visa lottery as it's called colloquially, is a program that was established 
uh, back in 1990. There were some precursor programs before that, but basically the program as we know it was established in 1990. That lets in about 50,000, lets in 50,000 people a year based on a, an immigration lottery. Uh, the qualifications for registering for the lottery are that you have to be from a country that had low immigration in previous five years, and the person who's applying for the lottery uh, has to either have a high school degree or, if they have no education, at least two years of experience in a job that requires two years of training. So the criteria are very low. Um, the problems with the visa lottery are, are various. Uh, first, because the criteria are so low, either you have no education at all and very little skills, or you have a minimum of education and no skills at all. And because it's a lottery, pretty much anybody on the planet who is from a qualifying country can take advantage of this. The State Department in 2003, the State Department's Inspector General Office observed that this uh, low eligibility criteria could lead to exploitation by terrorists. They warned about this in 2003. The GAO in 2007 echoed that warning. Again, warning that terrorists could take advantage of the diversity visa program. Uh, also, the program is racked with fraud. Uh, in 2003, the State Department IG, 15 years ago, noted that the program was rife with pervasive fraud. The fraud, the, the low eligibility standards, all this contribute to its potential exploitation by terrorists and other malified actors. Bangladesh is an interesting case. Uh, that's the country where yesterday's suspect came from. Uh, that country uh, uh, was a uh, high user of the visa lottery program. In fact, in 2000, seven, which was the peak year for that country's use of the visa lottery, 27% of the immigrants from that country came through that program, through the visa lottery program. Uzbekistan, which was the country of origin of the alleged, um, uh, the, the truck driver from October 31st in New York City, uh, in 2010, 70%, 70% of immigrants from Uzbekistan came through the visa lottery program. So that program is used as a prime avenue for immigration for many countries. Finally, let me touch on the subject of chain migration. Uh, what, when I use that word, what I'm talking about is a person who comes to this country and who in turn employs one of these many avenues that I just described, principally family-based, to sponsor relatives who are in the home country to come and join him or her. Because the categories that we have that I just described in family-based migration are so extensive, uh, it's not just nuclear family, you also have as I say, adult unmarried children, brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews. You can sponsor a person like yesterday's alleged terrorist at the extremity of that chain, and then that person in turn can sponsor people and so on and so on indefinitely. Hundreds of thousands of people come into this country every year based on these extended family migration categories. And it is my view, it is our administration's view, uh, that that is not the way that we should be running our immigration system. A system like that, uh, that includes something like the diversity visa program, these extended family categories are not the way anybody would have designed this immigration system if we could start from scratch today. What we need is an immigration system that is selective. We want to be able to select the types of people that are coming here based on criteria that ensure their success, criteria that ensure their ability to assimilate successfully in our country. And random lotteries, uh, extended family connections, that's not the way to run our immigration system. So I appeal, we appeal to the Congress as they consider these matters as we speak, uh, and in the coming weeks, to seriously take into account these concerns that we have with the way the immigration system is structured and its vulnerabilities, as I just described, and correct that. Um, uh, at that point, uh, uh, my formal comments are concluded. I'll uh, answer any questions you have. Quick question. Uh, yeah. In, in the middle. Thanks a lot, Mr. Susna. I want to ask you a question about what you're suggesting. Is it your belief that the only changes that can be done to the immigration system are ones that need to emanate from Congress? Are there any things that the President can do on his own, by executive action, by executive order, uh, to change the process for either chain migration or the visa lottery? Well, I mean, that's, uh, that's something we're, we're looking at right now in USCIS, USCIS, my agency, uh, which is the agency that administers all these visa programs. And uh, there are some things that we could do. There are some things that the president has directed us to do by executive order, uh, in particular with the temporary visa categories. We're talking about green cards here. 
But if you look at temporary visa categories, yes, there's a lot of things that we could do and that we're going to do, for example, to increase protections of American workers. Uh, in the green card domain, it's a little harder. Uh, Congress has kind of occupied that field a little more densely than it has in the temporary visa area. But there could be, there could be, there could be some things that we could do to uh, clarify how these, uh, how these categories are administered. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Sir, um, would, uh, in, uh, there's so much talk about the DACA <coughs> legislation right now. Uh, do you think uh, any DACA bill would have to be tied to bring in a merit-based system? Well, I mean, we, uh, about two months ago, the president announced his immigration priorities. Uh, you can find it on the White House website. It's a long list of about several dozen priorities that we, uh, career officials at DHS and at the other relevant immigration agencies at the time I was a career official came up with as the things that we need to be able to do our jobs and in that list uh, there are these fixes that I'm just talking about including getting rid of the diversity visa program because of it's just it it just degrades the integrity of our immigration visa programs generally uh, ending chain migration these are all things that we have suggested in our in our in the priorities that the president advanced so we hope we we hope and expect that Congress will take those priorities seriously and will do as much as they can to accomplish the goals that we set forth. Is that an absolute must, though, that the president signs a doctor bill that we have to have a merit based system? Can I, I, that somewhat? I can't speak for the president's priorities and what he does or doesn't want in a bill, but I know that what what I want is something that I can implement and that I can implement well to get at the priorities that we set forth as something that we need to do our job. Yes, sir. Yeah. Would be in favor of uh, extending the uh, blanket travel bans as far as the countries that are concerned, such as Bangladesh, which isn't on the list currently. Uh, my position on that is that my agency needs as much information as it can get from these other countries to be able to vet and screen people adequately to ensure that malified actors don't come into the country. To the degree that that, that can be done under the executive order, uh, the, the protocols established by the executive order, I'm all for it. Uh, but I. I'm not in a position to prescribe whether the blanket ban, as you put it, should be extended or not extended. I just I want the information that these countries can give us to screen people. How, Sir, how yes. do you deal with people who have been here for years and then become radicalized once they're here? How would any of that deal with what actually happened in New York? He had been here for many years. So on that, there's two points. I think um, the criticisms that we have of the diversity visa program or chain migration, in particular the diversity visa program. Uh, the, the vulnerability to exploitation by terrorists because of the low eligibility criteria and because of the, of the prevalence of fraud, that's not changing. That's, 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 a, 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 that's a sad fact of that program. For that reason, regardless of when the person became radicalized, uh, I just want that door shut because it's a vulnerability. It's been recognized for 15 years. Now, with respect to that person in particular and what do we do of people who radicalize afterwards, my agency in particular, I mean, uh, is focused very much so on, ins on ensuring that immigration doesn't stop when the person gets the green card. It's, it's, a, a, it's an ongoing process. I view it that way. I think uh, that we haven't, so. well, I mean, it, because what you want is an immigrant to become a citizen. I mean, citizenship is in the name of my agency. We ultimately want people to naturalize because naturalization is one of the best, it's one of the best signs that a person has fully assimilated and it's also once you naturalize it's one of the best guarantors of that person's continued success in our society we want people to naturalize and my agency is seeking to do everything it can to ensure that people uh, are, are enabled to do that and succeed in that in that quest put a time on it? Just, just to follow up quickly is it your understanding that the suspect was radicalized before he came here or do you think that it happened here and if it did happen before he arrived then was something inherently missed? No, I, I have no idea. I don't know. Can you so give us any sense oh. of where he picked I, up I, his... I truly have no idea uh, if he was radicalized at all. I don't know. I, I don't know that, that part of the investigation. Well, well, you just said that because of the criteria and how low it is that chain migrant immigrants or diversity lottery immigrants are more susceptible to being self-radicalized. Do you have data on that? No, I, what I think my point is, is that if you have immigrant visa programs where the eligibility criteria are low to non-existent or even an outright lottery, you're not, gonna, you're not selecting for the types of people according to, that we want in this country according to a criteria that will ensure their success in our nation that will ensure that they will assimilate well. well 
I get that, that as a matter of priority, you want to select the immigrants, not just have them come in. I get that part. But right. you seem to be saying that these kinds of immigrants are more likely to become terrorists. Uh, no. I, what I'm saying is that if you have a system that doesn't select at all, or is barely selecting anybody, uh, we don't know what we're going to get. It's better if we take an active affirmative role in our immigration process and establish criteria that correspond to things that we want to see in our immigration pool. Sir, in the back. Yes, I'm sort of following from that. Um, data shows that immigrants actually commit fewer crimes than native-born Americans. Other than these isolated incidents, is there any data behind this plan? Well, I don't know that I agree with your first point. I don't know where that data came from, but uh, I can't comment any further. Uh, the incarceration rates would be one example. Um, uh, that's a bigger debate uh, that I don't know that we have time for here, but uh, uh, based on my questioning the validity of, the, of, of the, pr the premise of your question, I don't know that I want to engage in that in that dialogue at this time. Does this administration believe that immigrants are more dangerous than U.S. citizens? I don't general? know that anybody has said that. Yes. Uh, uh, just two sort of points of clarification. I have you saying um, with the diversity visa program that there is a certain vulnerability because of the low eligibility criteria. By that, I think you mean because there's no higher education standard required. I mean, what is it that makes these people more vulnerable to radicalization and becoming terrorists? Well, there's two parts of that. My, the, the, my criticism of the diversity visa program is that the eligibility criteria are minimal or next to nothing, and that there's a random element to it. This so, vulnerability. Right. The program is vulnerable to exploitation by terrorists because the, it's, it's a combination of the low eligibility criteria and the ability to defraud the system. Fraud is pervasive, as I said, in the program. So if you are a malified actor and you want to use that program to come to this country, it's easy to fake a high school graduation the certificate. The said that this suspect was radicalized approximately in 2014. He entered the United States in 2011. So that is why so many of us are asking these questions, because it sounds like you are implying that U.S. intelligence or Homeland Security missed something and this guy was radicalized. Well, I'm not implying that at all. No, no. I'm, I'm just talking about the immigration programs. I'm not talking about this one guy. I don't so have sufficient... So actually effective at, at screening out terrorists. You're saying when they get here, because these people are more vulnerable, if they come in on this program, they are then subject to exploitation more easily? Uh, no. The, what I'm saying is that... We're just not yeah. getting the nexus to terrorism. The nexus to terrorism is that if you have a visa program that is easily exploited by malified actors, including terrorists, you because... Don't know that I don't know that he, I mean, he didn't come in on the visa, on the visa lottery program. He, he came in as a fan, as extended family-based immigrant. Right. But I'm saying with respect to the diversity visa program, which is also at play here, that program is, as the State Department IG found 15 years ago, and as the GAO confirmed in 2007, exploitable by terrorists or malified actors because the criteria are so low and easily faked. And it's a lottery. So... It's, there's on multiple levels. It's just it's an open door. It's it's problematic. It needs to shut. That's what I'm saying about that. With respect to the individual in yesterday's attempt, uh, I would say I don't know. I don't have a command of the facts relating to the investigation as to whether or if he was ever radicalized. What I'm saying is, if you have any sort of visa program, which is minimally selective, which is based solely on chance or lottery or low eligibility criteria then we as a government aren't doing our job in picking the people that come to this country in a competent and careful and intelligent way. And if we're not doing that, bad guys can come in. Are lottery we'll winners take vetted? Last question, yes. Are lottery winners vetted? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's screening. Oh, yeah. They're problem. screening like any other immigrant. Yeah. yeah. So that's an intelligence failure. Then. I don't know that there's any failure. Uh, yes. Last question. Thank yeah. you. Um, we, uh, we know from your uh, confirmation um, hearings testimony that both your mother and your mother-in-law are immigrants. Um, do you, how did their experiences shape your thinking on this position? And um, do you have any reason to believe that they would both would still have been able to come in and leave productive lives as Americans under the tightening that you're looking at now? The fact that my own mother and my mother-in-law are both immigrants has indeed influenced everything. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm interested in this field, why I'm interested in it, why I very passionately carry out my duties every day. I think, though, that you know, a, a policymaker or a citizen uh, who is examining all these questions should not be handicapped or shackled by 
previous immigration programs that from which we all been everybody in this room has benefited from the immigration laws of the past that doesn't mean that every generation doesn't have its own prerogative its own duty and responsibility to look at the situation that we have now and determine for itself ourselves whether the immigration laws should be changed it's perfectly rational so moving forward maybe we'll change things Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Continuing uh, with national security theme, as many of you saw this afternoon, the President signed the National Defense Authorization Act. This legislation, which was approved with bipartisan support, represents an important milestone in the President's plan to rebuild our military and bolster our national security. For the first time in seven years, we are increasing rather than shrinking the size of our forces. This NDAA also provides our military service members with the largest pay increase they've seen in eight years. To put into historical context, it authorizes one of the largest defense spending increases since the days of Ronald Reagan. Previous administrations sadly oversaw deep cuts to our armed forces with serious implications for our military readiness and capabilities. This hindered the fight against ISIS and other enemies of freedom and made our people less safe. In signing this bill today, the President once again made it clear that we are serious about enhancing military readiness, expanding and modernizing our forces, and providing our incredible men and women downrange with the tools they need to do what they do best, fight and win. President Trump also called on obstructionist Democrats in Congress to stop threatening to shut down the government. As the President said, at this time of grave global threats, Congress should send a clean funding bill to his desk that fully funds our great military. We certainly hope that will happen, and we look forward to that taking place. And with that, I will take your questions. Sure. Cecilia. Thank you, Sarah. The President said today that Senator Gillibrand would do anything for campaign contributions. Many, many people see this as a sexual innuendo. What is the president suggesting? Uh, I think that the president is very obvious. Uh, this is the same sentiment that the president has expressed many times before when he has exposed the corruption of the entire political system. In fact, he's used uh, similar terminology many times when talking about politicians of both parties, both men and women, uh, and certainly in his campaign to drain the swamp. The system is clearly broken. It's clearly rigged for special interest. And this president is someone that can't be bought. And it's one of the reasons that he's president today. So you're saying that this quote, Senator Gillibrand would do anything is a reference to campaign contributions in Washington, the swamp. This has nothing to do with her being a female. What is he alleging would happen behind closed doors with her? Uh, he's not alleging anything. He's talking about the way that our system functions as it is, that politicians uh, repeatedly beg for money. That's not something new. And that comment, frankly, isn't something new. If you look back at past comments that this president has made, uh, he's used that same terminology many times uh, in reference to men. There's no way uh, that this is sexist at all. This is simply talking about a system that we have that is broken, in which special interests control our government. And and I don't think that there's probably uh, many people that are more controlled by political contributions than the senator that the president referenced. Steve? Does the president want Roy Moore to be seated in the Senate if he wins tonight? And does he plan to call him tonight? Uh, in terms of calls, I, I'm not aware that anything is scheduled, uh, win or lose. In terms of being seated, I can't speak on a hypothetical, certainly not one that could potentially influence an election one way or the other due to the Hatch Act. John? Uh, Sarah, does the uh, president agree with his outside legal counsel that a special prosecutor should be appointed to look into the goings on at the Department of Justice during the election campaign in 2016 since the revelation about Bruce Orr, the former associate deputy attorney general? I think it's something that uh, certainly causes a lot of concern, not just for the president and the administration, but I think probably for all Americans and something that if we're going to continue to investigate things, let's look at something where there's some real uh, evidence and some real proof of wrongdoing. And this looks pretty bad. And I think it's something we should certainly look at. So, Dave? So, so what he, would, he, would he support the appointment of a special prosecutor to look into this? Uh, I haven't asked him that directly, but I, I know that he has great concern uh, about some of the conduct that's taken place and something that we certainly would like to see looked at. Dave? Thanks, Sarah. Uh, congressional leaders are saying that they have had no <coughs> plans to reimpose sanctions on Iran by the deadline tomorrow that the president initiated back in October when he decertified 
Iran's compliance with the nuclear deal. Is the White House okay with this, no action? And if so, um, where are the teeth in the President's uh, move to decertify them from compliance? Uh, look, the administration continues to make encouraging progress with Congress to fix the U.S.-Iran deal and address long-term proliferation issues. The, there was actually no deadline to act by this week as the administration did not ask that Congress introduce legislation to reimpose JCPOA-related sanctions. Jordan. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Senator Grassley said that he's advised the White House to reconsider the nomination of Jeff McKeer <coughs> to the federal court in Texas and Brett Talley in Alabama. Has the president <coughs> spoken to Senator Grassley about his concerns, and does the president plan to pull back those nominations? I'm not sure if they've spoken directly. I'll have to check and circle back with you. Matthew. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Bashar al-Assad and Rodrigo Duterte both recently have used the phrase fake news to dismiss damaging reports about their regimes. And a state official in Myanmar uh, recently said that the Muslim minority Rohingya don't exist and added it's fake news. Uh, is the White House concerned at all about authoritarian regimes adopting this phrase, fake news, to try to delegitimize the press? And does President Trump bear any responsibility for the popularization of this phrase among some world leaders? I think the White House is concerned about false and inaccurate information uh, being pushed out and to mislead the American people. I think I made that clear yesterday. Um, in terms of other leaders, uh, I'd have to look at their comments to be more specific on what they've said. But our concern is making sure that the information that the people receive in this country is fair and accurate. And when it isn't, uh, that it's corrected and corrected in the same fashion in which it was first presented when it was wrong, which is very rarely the case. Kristen. Using the term fake news, that doesn't, Sorry? when you hear autocrats using the term fake news to describe events that reflect poorly on their regimes that doesn't cause concern here look i'm not going to speak to specifics of another country when i don't know the details what i can talk about are the problems that we have in this country with inaccuracies uh that happen frequently within news stories and so I, that i feel comfortable speaking about without that information and that detail in front of me i don't want to weigh in too deeply Kristen. Sarah, thank you the president tweeted today that the accusations against him are false fabricated stories of women who I don't know and or have never met fake news. And yet the reality is he's pictured with a number of the women who have accused him of the misconduct. So do you concede that that part of his statement is not true? The president was referencing the three individuals that uh, were part of a press conference yesterday. And um, simply stating that you don't know someone means that you don't have a relationship with them. So uh, all of his accusers because they're- Correct, he was referencing the three from yesterday. And Sarah, members of Congress have called for an investigation into these accusations. If President Trump is confident that they are not true, would he support such an investigation? Look, the president uh, has answered these questions. Um, he has spoken to these accusations and denied and pushed that they are all false and fabricated accusations. Frankly, I think if Congress wants to spend time investigating things, they should probably focus on some of the things that the American people would really like them to investigate, like how to secure our borders, how to defeat ISIS, how to pass tax reform that actually impacts them. If you look at the issues and poll after poll after poll taken by a number of the outlets in this room, and pushed out regularly the issues that are top mind number one every single time the economy jobs national security immigration health care yet we never talk about those issues in fact 90 percent of the coverage well, that this is, is happening hold on as well let you finish i'm going to finish this statement 90 percent of the coverage that comes out of the media is negative and rarely covers those topics and those are the things that the american people want to talk about if congress wants to investigate something i think that they should look at some of the priorities of the, yet, Sarah, the people that they that actually represent. discussed in businesses all across the country. Uh, there have been some, a number of people who've been fired over this. So why not allow this congressional investigation to go forward and the president, if he's confident in, in the accusations being The involved. president has addressed these concerns. He's addressed them directly. You guys spent months talking about them on the campaign trail and the American people voted for this president. They have confidence in this president and they wanted him to lead our country and they wanted him to focus on things like the economy, focus on health care, focus on fixing our broken tax system, focus on fixing our borders and focus on national security. That's what we're here to do. That's what we're focused on. We've These questions have been asked and answered and we're ready to move forward and focus on the questions of the day that the American people have. April. 
Is um, Gillibrand owed an apology for the misunderstanding from the president's tweet this morning? Because many, including the senator, think that it's about um, sexual innuendos. I think only if your mind is in the gutter would you have read it that way. And um, so, no, Hunter. It, 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 no, it's not. It's it, when, when he went to say, what he said was open and it, it was not mined in the it's obviously talking about uh political partisan games that people often play and the broken system that he's talked about repeatedly this isn't new this isn't a new sentiment this isn't new terminology uh he's used it several times before as i said a few minutes ago he's used it several times before uh referencing men of both uh both parties, in fact. And so I think that there, if you look back at the past comments he's made, it was very clear what his reference was. Hunter? So um, looking at this issue with the system, um, the president gave almost $8,000 to Senator Gillibrand over the years. Um, his daughter also gave her $2,000. What specifically did they get for these contributions that she was offering? Look, I think oftentimes what you do, uh, you're getting access. A, a member of Congress will take your phone call, uh, they'll take your meeting, and if you're driving something as a businessman that the president may or may not have been driving at any particular point, uh, you can talk to that individual about it, and sometimes they carry your water. That's the reason that we have a broken system. That's a reason that often special interests control our government more than the people do. And that's one of the reasons that this president ran to be president. And it's one of the top reasons I think that he won and that he's sitting in the Oval Office today and Hillary Clinton's not because he couldn't be bought and everybody know that knew that she could because they'd seen it time and time again. So is he admitting that he bought access in a corrupt way? Look, I think he is admitting that he's participating in a rigged system. Uh, he said that on the campaign trail. He knows how the system works. I think uh, it would be disingenuous for anybody not to understand that. But at least this president is being honest about the process and his willingness to actually fix it and drain the swamp. Mara? So, Christian Gillibrand called for him to resign, and he says over and over again that he's a counterpuncher. So the next day after she does that, he wakes up and you're saying that he's tweeting about the campaign finance system. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the fact that she's controlled by special interest. Okay. I'm talking about the fact she's a wholly owned subsidiary of people that donate to her campaign. She's a puppet for Chuck Schumer. I'm talking about a number of issues that she has, none of which make her an independent individual, uh, but more somebody that is controlled by people uh, that help donate money to her cause. That's simply all I'm stating. What finance reform does the president want? Look, the president's been uh, talking about the need for us to uh, – put a stronger ban on lobbyists participating in the pro in the government process. We've taken a stronger ethics pledge under this administration than previous administrations. Uh, I think those are some of the first steps and something that we're going to continue working on over the next seven years. John? Thanks a lot, Sarah. Uh, you're familiar with uh, the president's <coughs> tweets. He tweets pretty often. Um, in this particular I've noticed that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a little bit. Uh, in this particular case, his criticism of Senator Gillibrand was very personal. Why must he criticize in such personal terms? He called a sitting elected U.S. Senator a lightweight. Why, why, why go after her in such personal such a personal matter. I don't think that's all, all that personal. I mean, if you want to talk about personal, look at the comments that she's made about this president uh, over the last several months. Um, look, the president is always going to be somebody who responds. We've said that many times before, and he's simply talking about a system that doesn't work for the citizens of this country, and he wants to fix it. Trey? Thanks, sir. Two quick questions for you. One following up on John's question from earlier about a second special counsel. Does the president have confidence in the FBI as it exists today? Look, the president has confidence in Director Ray and his ability to clean up some of the mess left behind by his predecessor. Uh, I know I've addressed that before, and he certainly has confidence in the rake and file members of the FBI. A follow up on foreign policy. Today, Bloomberg has an article out about the Trump administration encouraging Saudi Arabia to consider bids from US companies as it relates to building nuclear reactors. Does the president see this as an opportunity to bring up human rights in Yemen during these talks with Saudi Arabia? Uh, I'm not aware of those specific conversations uh, in this process, so I would have to ask and certainly get back to you. Take one last question, Margaret. Thank you. Um, HR McMaster uh, gave some really interesting remarks at a luncheon earlier today, um, and he spoke in, in really strong terms about China and Russia. Uh, he said they were undermining the international order and stability and ignoring the sovereign rights of their neighbors and the rule of law. 
Uh, he went on to talk about Russia in particular. Uh, he didn't use the words election meddling, but he talked about subversion, disinformation, propaganda, and basically pitting uh, people against each other to try to create crises of confidence. So what I wanted to know is, uh, does the president agree with all of Mr. Uh, uh, General McMaster's statements, and is that a foreshadowing of a national security strategy that will take a harder tack on Russia and China than the administration has so far? Look, I think we've been uh, very hard on Russia from the beginning. There have been sanctions. We've increased uh, energy exportation from this country, and we've done things to put pressure on Russia asking them to engage in a bigger and greater way on some of the common enemies that we face. In terms of like a rundown, I haven't had a chance to sit down with the president and go detail by detail, but uh, General McMaster certainly is um, someone who understands and knows the president's feelings uh, and our relationships with foreign partners and something that we certainly feel confident in him speaking about. Thanks so much, guys. Could we please get the president out here for final podium? Could we please see the president out?